the software developer conference for Unix system unification. Unix system 5 release 4.0. The worldwide open industry standard. Good morning. My name is Garrett Long. I'm a development supervisor with Bell Laboratories. In my talk today, I will set the stage for and introduce the features of Unix System 5 Release 4.0. It has been nearly five years since AT&T asked the industry to consider Unix System 5 as standard. And much has happened in that time to make that a fact. Recently, a group of companies that collectively ship more than 70% of the Unix system sold today formed Unix International for the express purpose of endorsing Unix System 5 Release 4.0 as the standard for the Unix operating system. Unix System 5 Release 4 combines technology from the three major variants of the Unix operating system, Unix System 5, the Xenix system, and the Berkeley system. For the first time, Unix System 5 Release 4.0 unifies the major variants of the Unix operating system into a single standard source code release of the Unix operating system software. Indeed, it is precisely because Release 4 combines all four of the major variants that we feel confident in asserting that Unix System 5 means open systems now. Because as you will see through the course of this talk, that you can begin now to implement applications on any of the major variants of the Unix operating system and be sure that those applications will run on the single standard platform that's represented by Unix System 5 Release 4.0. But first, before we go on to talk more about Release 4, let's understand what it really means to have open systems. Well, what open systems mean more than anything else is an expanded marketplace. With open systems, we mean that we've removed many of the obstacles to entry into the marketplace. These are obstacles that are represented by proprietary operating systems and proprietary software. Because this expanded marketplace is really based on standard interfaces. And more importantly, standard interfaces that are independent of any particular vendor's hardware. But this kind of standardization of interfaces and this kind of expanded marketplace really is more of a market unification. Because what we're talking about is a market that is centered on standards on single definitions for what systems and software should do. These standards result in reduced costs, especially in software development, because no longer must software developers spend their time developing their applications to different variants or different variations on the same platform, but instead can spend their time and their effort in increasing the functionality and concentrating on the value that is important to their customers. But it also means reduced costs in terms of reduced support costs, because now we can focus our effort in support for single standard operating environments instead of for many different vendor variations. It also means, therefore, increased profits and increased productivity. Now this slide describes the process that's really leading us to open systems. It shows the forces that are combined, beginning with customer needs, to get us to the products that realize open systems. In fact, this chart really represents a kind of traditional flow of uh, the development of systems, from customer needs to system requirements, and then to the products that, that actually realize the system. But what's new in this are the standards that are introduced in an open system environment. Now, I want to spend most of my time in this talk talking about these standards. So this chart actually describes the flow of the talk as we go through it today. This chart depicts the deep data processing expenditures that are driving the customer needs for open systems. I'm sure we're all acquainted with this pattern of DP expenditures, but what's important to notice is the 40% that is created by the personnel costs of training and retraining people as we bring in new systems and adopt new technologies to achieve even better price performance. 
What customers need is freedom of choice to choose between different vendors, while at the same time protecting their investment in the systems they've already developed and in the training of their people. They also need ease of integration so that they can easily bring in new technology and new systems and make them work with the systems that they already have. And of course, all of this with the objective of achieving systems with the greatest possible price performance. Well, now that we've seen what the customer needs are, let's see if we can understand what the requirements are for systems to actually meet those needs. This slide enumerates the requirements for systems to meet the customer needs for openness. As we can see, uh, the systems that will meet these customer needs possess the properties of portability, scalability, and interoperability. Let me just take a minute to define these words. Portability is the ability for customers to choose from a wide range of application software and know that that software will run on a wide range of different vendor platforms. Scalability is the property of being able to establish a single software environment that works across the entire range of computers, from the desktop computers all the way to the largest supercomputers. And interoperability is the ability to mix and match hardware and software and be sure that all of the pieces will work together. Now, each of these requirements serves to satisfy the particular customer needs that are listed on the right. Because with portability, we can choose between different vendors' platforms and know that our application software will run on any of them. Scalability protects the customer's investment because as their business grows and they need machines of greater capacity, they can maintain the same software environment and hence maintain the same systems. And interoperability, of course, satisfies the need for ease of integration because with interoperability, we can mix and match application software and hardware to obtain the systems with the best price performance. Well, now that we know what the system requirements are to meet those customer needs, how do we actually get systems that have the necessary properties of portability, scalability, and interoperability? Well, the key to achieving these is the base operating system. By establishing a standard base operating system that runs across all hardware architectures from the desktop personal computers all the way to the largest supercomputers, we achieve the property of scalability. And by having that same base operating system supported by many different vendors, we achieve the property of portability. But a base operating system only establishes a software execution environment. It only establishes the most minimal runtime environment. And this is not really enough to support software development. For that, we need to go into extensions to the base operating system. And it's with extensions that we begin to address the matter of interoperability. Now, this slide lists just a few of the Im important kinds of extensions that we have. We have extensions in the area of user interface and, and end user functionality, toolkits to support those user interfaces, but also toolkits in general to support software development. We have extensions in the area of system administration, and of course, we have extensions to support the different kinds of protocol suites and networking architectures. But how can we be sure that a system actually meets the requirements of portability, scalability, and interoperability? In other words, how can we be sure that we have that kind of standard base operating system? And here's where standards really come into play. But before we go to talk more about standards, let's really understand what a standard is. Well, a standard really represents a consensus or an agreement. And it's a consensus or agreement on what should be used as a basis for measurement and comparison. In the area of computers, of course, our standards document interfaces and define the functionality that's required of a system. But of course, for something to be a usable standard, it must do more than merely define things. It also has to provide a basis for testing and establishing the conformance to those specifications. So what this means is that we're looking at something as is depicted on this slide here. Something like the, the standard development process where we go from the specification for a system through the implementation to that specification and finally to some form of system testing 
that verifies that the implementation actually matches the specification. But what's new in this process now are standards. Because those standards are publicly available. That means that all of the vendors have available to them the specifications that they should implement to. But more importantly, the customers have those specifications available and the means to verify that a vendor's products actually meet those specifications. Well, having discussed some of what a standard is, where do we actually get them from? Well, as we mentioned earlier, a, a standard represents a consensus or an agreement. And this slide here depicts the different parties that are actually involved in establishing standards, especially in the area of Unix systems. As we can see on the slide, we have industry groups or trade associations, we have government agencies, we have standards bodies and organizations, and we have academic and educational institutions. I'll now take some time to speak to each of these groups in turn. Well, possibly most important in establishing commercial standards are industry groups, because they represent the users and the vendors engaged in buying and selling the products in question. And in the area of Unix system standards, the first to actually begin work on a standard for the Unix operating system was slash user slash group, the international group of Unix system users and vendors. In 1984, user group began an effort to define a standard system interface for the Unix operating system because the members of user group, especially the software developers, had recognized that they were wasting much time and effort in developing and redeveloping their applications to the different variants of the Unix operating system then available. In 1984, user group produced their first draft of a standard for the Unix operating system and subsequently turned their work over to the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers, or the IEEE. The IEEE is also international in scope and represents professionals from the electronic and electrical industries. But what's most important here is that they have a vigorous standards program underway and have produced many standards. So user group felt that the work on the Unix system standard would be best carried forward by a group like IEEE. IEEE picked up the 1984 user group standard and continued the work under the heading of POSIX for Portable Operating System Interface for Computing Environments. At the same time that this work was going on, in Europe, a group of companies formed by, initially by Philips of Holland, ICL of England, Bull of France, Siemens and Nixdorf in Germany, and Olivetti in Italy, formed the XOPEN consortium for the purpose of defining standards for data processing equipment to establish a common application environment. Their work was codified in the XOPEN portability guide, which was first published in 1985. Now, the reason why XOPEN would have been formed is actually an interesting one, and it brings us to the next category that we have to talk about, namely government agencies. In the list of government agencies we have here, first on the list is the European Economic Community, or the European Common Market. And it was at the insistence of the EEC that the European companies mentioned before formed the XOPEN consortium. What these companies need is a unified pan-European marketplace into which to sell their equipment. And it was in recognition of this that the EEC urged them to form the XOPEN consortium. The XOPEN consortium, as we remarked, was responsible for defining a common application environment. And of course, to define such an application environment, they had to select a base operating system, as we discussed earlier. For this purpose, the XOPEN group chose the Unix operating system as the base operating system on which to define their common application environment. At the same time that this work was going on in Europe, in Japan, the Ministry for International Trade and Industry, or METI, had begun work on a project to develop computer-aided software engineering workstations. Under the name of the Software Industrialized Generator for Manufacturing Aids, or SIGMA, METI as well chose Unix System 5 as the base operating system for their case workstations. 
not only was work going on in both Europe and Japan to define uh, standards for a base operating system and common application environment, but also in the United States, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, who is responsible for the production of federal information processing standards, began work on a definition for an application portability profile that also specified the Unix operating system as the base operating system. But government agencies are really limited in scope and jurisdiction to their national, or at least in the case of Europe, to regional uh, jurisdiction. We need to go to standards bodies and organizations that are responsible for it, that have international responsibility, before we can really get the kind of worldwide consensus that we seek for Unix system standards. And principal amongst the standards bodies for the Unix system is the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO. Now, the ISO has a number of member bodies, each representing a different country's standards organization. And in the particular case of Unix standards, we're most interested in the American National Standards Institute, or ANSI. ANSI has been at work since 1983 on a standard for the C programming language. But in this particular context, the context for Unix, it is also important that they have a special relationship with the IEEE. The IEEE is accredited as a standards body with ANSI so that a standard that has passed the IEEE approval process immediately advances to the status of draft American national standard in ANSI, and ANSI can forward that to ISO for consideration as an international standard. So with the approval of the first of the POSIX standards in August of this year, standards for the Unix operating system are well on their way to becoming international standards. But we remarked that Unix system standards are, as standards, a consensus or agreement between the different parties. And most important in establishing such agreements are educational institutions because it's through educational institutions that people are trained on and technology is popularized. In the area of educational institutions at work on Unix system standards, most important is, of course, the University of California at Berkeley, whose variant, the Berkeley system, is one of the major variants unified in Unix system 5, release 4.0. But also influential in the area of Unix standards is Kyoto University, who's made contributions in the area of graphics packages towards the Sigma project sponsored by Meadey. And also, of course, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, whose work on the X window system has made contributions in the area of standards for user interfaces. Well, with all of these organizations that work on standards, uh, they've each had their own particular output. And this slide depicts each of those organizations and the outputs from the organizations. From AT&T came the System 5 Interface Definition, or SVID, and the System 5 Verification Suite to back that interface definition up. From XOpen come the XOpen System Interface, which is part of the XOpen Portability Guide, and the Verification Suite for XOpen Systems. From the American National Standards Institute, the Standard Specification for the Programming Language C, and from the Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers, the Portable Operating System Interface for Computer Environments, or POSIX. And from the National Institute for Standards and Technology, the Federal Information Processing Standards, and in particular, the POSIX Conformance Test Suite. Now, actually, as we look at this chart, uh, the situation looks kind of grim for a single standard. We thought we were going to get a single standard out of the whole process, and yet here we see no less than five. But in fact, the situation is not really as bad as it might appear, because all of these standards come from a common source and are all focused on a common end. So let's take some time now to talk about exactly where these standards came from. Well, I mentioned that in 1984, User Group was at work on a standard for the Unix operating system, and that this standard was to unify and to sort out the major variants that were present at that time. At that time, the principal version of the Unix operating system that was available was Unix System 3. And shortly thereafter, 
uh, AT&T had made available Unix System 5, which was their statement about what the standard should be for a commercial operating system for Unix system applications. Consequently, in 1984, AT&T published Issue 1 of the System 5 interface definition. For the first time, uh, this identified the base operating system and the first extension to the base operating system, the kernel extension. As we spoke about before, XOpen was at work on their XOpen portability guide and needed to select a base operating system to define their common application environment. For this purpose, they picked issue one of the System 5 interface definition to define what they called the XOpen System 5 specification, or XVS. But as we've also remarked, a base operating system only establishes a software execution environment. And we need more than that to create the kind of environment required for software development. For that reason, in 1986, AT&T published issue two of the System 5 interface definition which identified a number of extensions to the functionality defined in the base operating system identified in issue one. These were extensions in the area of end user functionality, extensions for software development tools, terminal interface capabilities, and also capabilities for system administration. Shortly thereafter, XOpen adopted most of these extensions and included them in issue two of the XOpen portability guide. Now, while both AT&T and XOpen were at work on their specification for System 5, ANSI was at work on their standard for the C programming language. ANSI's standard goes beyond merely specifying the syntax and semantics for the C programming language and also specifies approximately 150 library routines, which add functionality to the basic language. As we can see in this chart, the majority of those library routines are in fact covered in the functionality specified by the SVID and, and by XOpen. But some 30 or so actually fall outside of that area of functionality. These are mostly functions that address questions of multi-byte string handling and functions required for internationalization. As we can also see from this chart, though, the library routines only specify part of the functionality that's required for a base operating system. And to specify that remaining portion, we need to look at the system calls. This is the area that POSIX concentrated on. POSIX defined some 100 system calls for the Unix operating system, again, most of which are covered in the System 5 interface definition, but some 30 or so of which fall outside the functionality specified by SVID and by XPG. Of these 30 system calls, 10 are actually functionality that, that really existed in System 5, but has been given a new name. These are functions that handle terminal control uh, capabilities that would usually be handled by the IOCTL system call, which is not, in fact, included in the POSIX standard. The remaining portion of these 30 or so system calls represent Berkeley functionality, uh, reliable signals, handling, and job control functionality. Well, this means that combining ANSI-C and POSIX establishes uh, the kind of functionality required to set uh, a base operating system to meet the requirements that we spoke about earlier for open systems. But again, this, is, this only goes so far as to establish a execution environment for software. To really uh, specify a software development environment, we need to go well beyond that. And in issue three of the System 5 interface definition, we have extended the functionality of the base operating system, specifically in the area of user interface functionality for further extensions to the base operating system, but also moving some of the functionality from the network services extension, the streams I.O. interfaces, and the transport layer interface into the base to produce a, an enhanced base operating system in issue three of SVID. But up to this point, we've only been talking about standards. And standards, of course, only create specifications. It's products that actually implement those specifications and produce something that customers can really use in their systems. The standards define interfaces, 
interfaces that the components of products must comply to, and it's the standards that define the functionality, but it's the products that actually yield something that performs that functionality. So now, we need to talk about the products that implement those standards and the products that actually realize open systems. Well, Unix system unification, as we've talked about, conforms to all of the standards defined for the base operating system and extensions, as in XOpen, the system call specifications in POSIX, and the library routines in ANSI C. But Unix system unification is more about the consolidation of the functionality and capabilities from the major variants of the Unix operating system, Unix System 5, the Sun OS system, Xenix System 5, and the Berkeley system. We've talked about portability, scalability, and interoperability as requirements for open systems, but it's also important that we have availability because we actually have to have something if we're going to really do something. The Unix operating system has been available since 1975 when it was first licensed to educational institutions, but it was really in 1979 with version 7 of the Unix operating system that the operating system really gained in popularity. And it was at that time that the first major variant of the Unix operating system began development. That is the Berkeley system. Each of the major variants of the Unix operating system commanded a different segment of the marketplace. The Berkeley system found favor principally amongst scientific and engineering users on technical high-end workstations. The Xenix system was predominant in the so-called low-end or desktop computer marketplace, while Unix System 5 was most popular in multi-user commercial systems. But over time, these segments of the marketplace have begun to come together, partly through the force of technology with more powerful microprocessors, uh, raising the capacity and power of the desktop computers to rival that of the technical workstations, but also with commercial users using the same technical workstations that were previously used only by scientific and engineering users. And with multi-user commercial systems like those on which Unix System 5 is found, are finding their way into the middle of networks made up of personal computers and those workstations. This brings us to an important point about Unix system unification because the unification is not merely a question of bringing together the different features of the variants, the Berkeley system, the Xenix system, and Unix system 5, but it also represents a market unification because the, combina the unification of these different segments of the marketplace call for a single standard release of the Unix operating system, and that release is Unix system 5 release 4.0. I now want to take some time to discuss the different features of Unix System 5 Release 4, and I'll speak about them in terms of different groupings. The first of these groupings is the basic operating system services. And in Unix System 5 Release 4, we're building upon the basic capabilities implicit in Unix System 5 Release 3.2, especially the Xenix system code compatibility. This is source code compatibility for systems other than the 386, but also for the Intel 386 binary code compatibility for Xenix system applications. Of course, we're complying with the industry standards represented by the POSIX 1003.1 and ANSI X3 J11C standard, and are bringing in functionality from the Berkeley system. Uh, for the first time in System 5, the C shell, the standard shell interface for the Berkeley system, as well as the fast file system from Berkeley. We're also supporting selected commands and all of the system calls for the Berkeley system distribution, except for some four system calls relating to uh, an effective user ID. Also, the symbolic link capabilities that are implicit in the Berkeley file system. From Sun OS, we're bringing in mapped file capabilities that are based on the virtual memory services of Sun OS. And also, new features have been incorporated in the base operating system services for Release 4. Enhancements to the Streams I.O. subsystem, 
further work on internationalization, more work on the 8-bit cleanup, the virtual file system, which allows us to support simultaneously the Berkeley file system and the System 5 file system, as well as new types of file systems that we'll discuss. And for the first time, the corn shell will be included in the supported source code release. Previously unsupported, the corn shell is now a fully supported part of the standard Unix System 5 release. The Unix operating system has always been an operating system by programmers and for programmers with the expectation that in providing the best software development environment, we'll get the best software developed. And Unix System 5 4.0 carries on that tradition. As I said before, it complies with the industry standards established by IEEE and, and ANSI for the C programming language. But it also includes new capabilities for software development, especially the process file system, which using the virtual file system and virtual memory services of the base operating system, for the first time allow programmers to inspect the address space of a running process as though it were a file, because the address space of the process is mapped into a file in the specialized process file system. But also new capabilities for message management to assist in the handling of warning and error messages, as well as capabilities available in other operating systems, but now for the first time available in the Unix operating system, capabilities like dynamic linking. There's a lot of work in networking in release 4.0. Uh, building on the basic capabilities implicit in 3.0, the streams I.O. interface, the listener functions for the transport layer, Honey Danber UUCP, the transport layer interface itself, and the remote file sharing capabilities. We've now added the support for the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA standards, the transmission control protocol and internet protocol, and the data communication services built on those, the terminal emulation of Telnet, the file transfer protocol, and simple message transfer protocol. And also, from the Berkeley system, the programmatic interface to those data communication capabilities, the sockets interface, and the remote commands, the so-called R-star commands here, as well as the network access facility, INET-D. From SunOS, we now have support for the network file system in Unix System 5, as well as support for the basic capabilities that underlie the network file system, the remote procedure call, or RPC, the external data representation, or XDR, and also new functions have been added to release 4. New functions in the area of network selection, functionality for name to address mapping, and also enhancements to the mail system. Much work has gone on in Release 4.0 in the area of user interface, building on the traditional character-oriented capabilities from Curse's term info. 3.2 introduced extensions that are supported in Release 4.0, extensions to Curse's term info, the extended terminal interface, which supports forms and menu interfaces for character-oriented terminals, and also the form and menu language interpreter, FMLI, which provides a programming language interface to the ETI capabilities. And a specific application of FMLI, the Framed Access Command Environment, or FACE. And also the XWindow server that was present in 3.2 XWin. From SunOS, the network extensible window system. And in the area of industry standards, the XWindow system and the X Toolkit. New, newly added in release 4.0 are the toolkits both for X and the news development environment toolkit to support open look applications and also a merged server for X11 and network extensible window system the X11 news merged server we've also introduced an enhancements to system administration in release 4.0 these are enhancements to support uh, easier software installation and removal, uh, simplified and enhanced configuration uh, management for add-on software packages, improvements to backup and restore, and improvements to the user interface for system administration, as well as merged administrative capabilities for the network file system and remote file sharing. 
and also capabilities to support the so-called UFS, the Berkeley file system, as the Unix file system in release 4.0. And I think one of the most important things introduced in release 4.0 is something that's not really a, a feature at all, and that's the application binary interfaces. With the System 5 interface definition and the POSIX and ANSI C standards, we've achieved a high degree of source code compatibility for the Unix operating system. And now with release 4, we're taking that effort further into work on binary code compatibility. The application binary interfaces to find binary portability for software within a processor architecture and go beyond the source code specifications to be found in SVID to provide definitions for the object code interfaces and object file formats. This work is going on between AT&T and major microprocessor manufacturers such as Intel, Motorola, Sun for the Spark architecture, and also Intergraph and MIPS all with the objective of establishing binary interface standards for the Unix operating system. Now, we all know that computer dealers don't stock source code, and I don't think any of us would really want them to stock source code. What they stock is binary software packaged in shrink wrap boxes. And what the objective of the ABI is, is to achieve that shrink wrap compatibility that will allow us to run that software right out of the box on different vendor systems that have complied with the System 5 application binary interface. As this slide depicts, the objective is that different vendors who are using the same microprocessor architecture, in this instance the Intel architecture, and who have further complied with the application binary interface for Unix System 5, could be assured that application software that conformed to that interface would run on any of those boxes right out of the package. What this means is that with the ABIs, we would now be able to bring to the Unix System 5 marketplace the kind of compatibility and homogeneity that has previously been enjoyed by the PC marketplace. This is one more effort in market unification that's present with Unix System 5 release 4.0. Indeed, following this point about market system unification, let's take a look at what the size of the Unix system marketplace is, and especially the size for that Unix system 5 release 4.0 market. Well, according to the International Data Corporation, IDC, the Unix system marketplace in 1986 was about $5 billion in, dollar, in total dollar volume. And they predict that it will grow to $20 billion by 1992. But that in particular, Unix system's share of the total marketplace will represent some 22% in 1991. This means that from a growth of, or from a, a market share of 6% in 1986, the Unix operating system now occupies over one-fifth of the total data processing marketplace in the subsequent five years. And as this chart, as one can see from this chart, the important part of that growth is really at the expense of a segment of the marketplace that is presently held by a multitude of different operating systems. So that the Unix system's growth really represents a consolidation of this disparate marketplace and a unification of that market. IDC further reports that there were some 700,000 systems running the Unix operating system at the end of 1987, and estimates that there will be over 2.8 million systems running the Unix system by the end of 1991. In other words, by the end of 1991, there'll be four times the number of Unix system installations as there were at the end of 1987. Over two million new Unix systems in the next four years. In fact, we shipped our one millionth Unix system at the end of 1988, and with a growth rate of 60%, I think it's fair to characterize this as truly explosive growth. Well, we've covered the customer needs that are fueling the drive to open systems, the system requirements to meet those needs, the standards that ensure that systems possess those requirements, 
the products that realize those standards and the open systems that will result from those products. And it's based on the recognition that Unix System 5 satisfies all those requirements, meets those standards, and represents a unification of the major variants of the Unix operating system, that we say that Unix System 5 represents the platform for software developers and for companies to establish their open systems now. Because companies and developers can begin work on applications on any of the major variants, the Berkeley system, the Xenix system, or Unix system 5, and begin that work now with the assurance that when Unix system 5 release 4.0 is available, those applications will run on the single unified platform for the Unix operating system. Thank you. The Software Developer Conference for Unix System Unification. Unix System 5 Release 4.0. Basic Operating System Services. Hi, I'm Rick Struess from AT&T Bell Laboratories, and I'm here today to talk to you about Basic OS Services and Unix System 5 Release 4. Uh, we talk about Basic OS Services as the core of Unix System 5, uh, that part of the operating system, commands, system calls, and library functions that you'd expect to see on every system. Uh, the kinds of things that programmers and users rely upon alike. Um, today we're going to be talking about a, a large variety of topics in this session. Um, we're going to start with an overview of Unix System 5 Release 4 and give you a sense of the architecture, the design of the operating system, uh, some of the things we've done to change the operating system, and also what the compatibility picture looks like for both users and programmers. Then we're going to move into a discussion of commands. Uh, touch on that briefly, again hitting on the highlights. Then move into files and file systems, followed by I.O. and interprocess communication. Uh, then moving into a discussion of processes and process services. Finally wrapping up with internationalization, uh, which is a real interesting topic, uh, especially in the marketplace today. If I had to sum up Unix System 5 Release 4 simply, it would be this picture. No if defs. Uh, no if defs, that is, to distinguish OS variants. This is one of the goals of Unix System 5 Release 4. I think everyone in the marketplace realizes that the time people spend, the programmers and users spend, getting used to one system and then moving over to another system doesn't do anyone any good. Uh, there's a lot of uh, small differences, in some cases large differences, between different instances of the Unix system. Uh, and what we need to see is a unification of the industry around a single set of standard interfaces. The implementation of those interfaces may change, but the interfaces remain the same. Uh, the if def BSD, is this a straw car, is it is an index, is it strings.h or string.h, uh, is the kind of thing that plagues programmers uh, throughout the Unix system industry. And we think Unix System 5 Release 4 uh, represents a coming together of the important parts of the Unix system. In talking uh, through this session, we're going to keep coming back to a chart that looks like this, uh, in that we're going to show the feature, deri uh, the feature derivation of Unix System 5 Release 4 and give you a sense of where the different pieces are coming from and what they mean when they come together in Unix System 5 Release 4. Uh, one of the things I want to point out before we go any further is that the entire topic here really stresses the AT&T Unix System 5 Release 4 source tape. That is, there is a set of facilities that are, that are on the source tape produced by AT&T. That source tape is then licensed to the industry. Um, what a particular vendor or OEM or source licensee decides to put on that tape is their decision. Now, as a user or as a software developer, what you need to do is talk to your vendor and find out what they are implementing of Unix System 5 Release 4, what's going to be on their set of binary floppies or their tape. Uh, one of the things that helps us are the various standards in the industry. 
things like POSIX or the application binary interfaces. Um, those are the kinds of things that a user or a programmer can use to decide if a particular vendor's implementation of the system uh, suits their needs. Let's uh, take a, a little more detailed look at the feature derivation and see where things are coming from. Uh, Unix System 5 Release 4, first of all, is a complete superset of Unix System 5 Release 3. Simply stated, if you're, if you're on Unix System 5 Release 3, um, you're going to find an extraordinarily easy migration path to Unix System 5 Release 4. In fact, a recipe, if you will, for Unix System 5 Release 4 is to take SVR3 and take out some pieces, put in some other pieces, but the interfaces remain the same. Now, we've extended those interfaces to incorporate new technology and some Berkeley technology, Xenix technology, but overall, it's a System 5 release. Uh, for those people who are concerned about Xenix compatibility, uh, Unix System 5 Release 4 continues the work that we started in Unix System 5 Release 3.2, and that is source, load, source code compatibility for Xenix applications. So if you have a Xenix program that uses the locking call or the nap call, you're going to find those in Unix System 5 Release 4. Uh, also on, on Intel uh, platforms, I think you're going to start to see uh, people with Unix System 5 Release 4 implementing binary compatibility as we've done on our 386 products in Unix System 5 Release 3.2. Moving along, we have uh, the BSD features. The people at Berkeley have done a lot of good work, and we decided to bring that in, working with our partner Sun Microsystems, to, uh, to uh, enhance the operating system. So we have features like the C shell, the fast file system, symbolic links, and a whole host of system calls and commands that really uh, bring in those things that people have said, gee, we wish these were in System 5, uh, a long-standing long standing, uh, thing we've heard in the industry, so we've done it in Unix System 5 Release 4. Industry standards, of course, are very, are very important, uh, very visible in the marketplace today. And here are just two of the key industry standards that SVR4 incorporates, and that's POSIX P1003.1 and the ANSI C standard. So if those are the standards that you are using to guide your business or your development, uh, you can rest assured that SVR4 is a complete superset of those. From SunOS, we have a, a variety of technologies. The most important uh, from a user perspective or a programmer perspective is the ability to map files and devices into your address space, which we'll talk about in uh, detail later. And that really is uh, a consequence of the uh, virtual memory architecture that we're incorporating into SVR4. Finally, it would not be enough if the release were simply uh, bringing existing technology together. We felt it was important that we have some new technology. Um, so we've done some things, for example, with streams, enhanced streams, or made streams more pervasive, if you will. We've made some real-time enhancements. We've uh, continued the work we began in internationalization and added a whole lot of other different facilities, such as the corn shell that people have said that they want in the Unix system release. So that's the general landscape of the release. Let's. Uh, Go into a little more detail in terms of uh, the standards, just to, again, reassure you that Unix System 5 Release 4 is a complete superset of these standards, whether it's the System 5 interface definition or SFID or the POSIX standard or the ANSI standard, Unix System 5 Release 4 is a complete superset. As, as uh, I'm sure you're aware, standards are one thing. Products are the implementation of those standards. Uh, so it's important to look at Unix System 5 Release 4 as relates to other products. As we said earlier, SVR4 is a complete superset of SVR3. In addition, it's a complete superset of the Xenix system. Uh, as we uh, show in the view graph, the, both the Berkeley system and SunOS are not completely subsumed by SVR4. And of course, the key question comes in then, uh, what exactly is left out? And there it's important to explain in working with people like Microsoft and Sun Microsystems, uh, we've tried to find the important technology in each of those systems that those vendors and their user communities have found uh, necessary to have in a system. And that, and that is the technology we've brought in. So necessarily there are some things that have not come in, but overall we've brought in all the major technology. Just want to hit on some benefits of SVR4 uh, as they relate to both programmers and users. Broadened markets comes to mind initially, and that is if we're not spending this time distinguishing between a BSD port and a System 5 port and a Xenix port, uh, we're probably spending more time being more creative in our software development. Um, so that you, you, you get that broadened market uh, almost automatically. Internationalization is another way we're going to broaden our markets by making it really possible and easy for a, a software developer to develop an application uh, that not only runs in a domestic United States marketplace, it can also run in Europe and Asia. Uh, program productivity, I think we've hit upon already. Um, 
again, this increased portability, the fact that when, you, when a customer moves from one machine to another, you have a, a very high likelihood that that software is going to run unchanged. Um, again, compatibility is nice. New functionality is critical. Um, from a software developer standpoint, I think we brought in some significant new technology in terms of easing uh, the programmer's ability to manipulate files and devices as part of their address space, which we'll talk about later. Uh, the enhancements we made to streams and really made that mechanism even more powerful from a user perspective. The things we've done to further support real-time processing, these all come together in a, in a more functional release from the user and programmer's perspective. Uh, finally, uh, consistency is an issue, and this comes uh, back to the point of having a single Unix system five, a unified Unix system, so programmers and users can get down to the business of doing their work, not worrying about variants. I think it's important that we talk about the architecture of SVR4 uh, simply because uh, it's the kind of thing that is, uh, is often discussed in the press, you know, what is SVR4, what's its architecture, how is it going to be implemented, and I think it's important that people understand that SVR4 really uh, retains the System 5 in, uh, implementation flavor. Uh, what I mean by that is we still have uh, hardware being communicated to by the kernel and the kernel is relatively standard technology, uh, programs request kernel services through the system call interface. Um, and that often uh, is done with the aid of library functions. So overall, uh, it's, a, it's a functional release uh, using relatively standard operating system technology. Now, there have been some things that have gone on in the release that really uh, are quite interesting at the kernel level. Again, something that the user is not going to necessarily have to worry about, but the user may perceive some benefits. Um, in, Designing the Unix System 5 release for kernel, we've done some things uh, in terms of dynamic memory allocation, as an example, uh, to further improve uh, not only the portability of the Unix System kernel, but also its usefulness in a variety of vi environments. And we'll touch on some of those issues as we go along. <clears throat> some feature highlights, uh, just going down a list. Uh, from POSIX, we have the P1003.1 compliance, uh, which is important for anyone who's been tracking those uh, POSIX efforts. Um, for people who are coming from a BSD environment or who are managing both the System 5 and a BSD environment, this unification really is key. So getting those features in as we've done with Xenix. So you really can think of three paths all, meet, all meeting. Um, also, memory map files again are, are going to be an important way for applications to deal with both files and devices as a, a uniform part of their address space. And the virtual file system is a whole architecture that allows great diversity in the implementation of an underlying file system, but it preserves that interface at the top, that the user really gets to, to see that consistent interface, but the, un the, but the underlying details of implementation and the performance gains or the, the different uh, criteria one may have for implementing a file system are all hidden in, in, a, in a lower layer. I've used the term streams pervasiveness, and I think we're going to see that later on in the I.O. section. Uh, the streams mechanism, uh, which was introduced in SVR3, uh, is continued in SVR4 and has been enhanced. And we're using it more and more places. The, really, the bottom line is that users get to benefit from streams uh, throughout their programming efforts. If you're doing real-time programming, our support for real-time processing, I think, is a key feature. Um, not that Unix, SV, the Unix System 5 Release 4 is a complete real-time system, but we've made uh, some important enhancements uh, to support real-time applications. Finally, for people who are trying to address an international market, uh, Unix System 5 Release 4 really represents uh, the ability to, to go and hit those markets that you wouldn't otherwise be able to. I think it's important we start off with commands. Uh, commands are what we hit first in a, in a Unix system. Um, it, it's what users first perceive when they log in, of course. Um, and therefore, we want to talk about what is in the SVR4 command set. First of all, we're starting off with the SVR3.2 command set. And to that, we're adding in key Berkeley and Xenix commands that people have told us are important. Uh, that's really where people like Microsoft and Sun Microsystems come in, giving us that valuable input, what their user communities see as important. We've also added in new commands. As we add new facilities, we are also adding in new command level interfaces where appropriate. In merging the command set, we've been real conscious of not to just have a conglomeration of different facilities with redundancy uh, left and right. 
we've really tried to do is architect a system uh, such that there really still is, in most cases, one good way of doing something. Uh, there are some cases where there are just two diverse user communities and we do need to support both, but we have a technique for dealing with that. We talk about moving things into Unix System 5 Release 4 proper, and we also talk about commands and, and, and also other facilities that are in a compatibility package. That, comp that compatibility package is key simply because it allows us to provide these important facilities so that vendors and source licensees can go and put these facilities on their systems to have a good migration path for the users, but they're not finding their way into the standards. And we're trying to help guide people uh, into using standard level interfaces uh, in the future. We're trying to make that migration path as easy as possible. And as we go through this, I think you'll see that we've done a pretty good job. In looking at the command set, uh, it's important to understand what the various subdivisions are. Uh, we have uh, two uh, small subdivisions in there. We have SVID defined commands, System 5 interface definition. We also have those commands that are in a compatibility package. There are commands that lie outside those two circles, inside the command set. Those are things that are part of System 5 proper, but do not find their way into standards. Uh, things like system administration facilities um, have not been uh, standardized in the System 5 interface definition. And therefore, they're part of System 5. Uh, they're not in the compatibility package, but you're not going to find them in the SVID. As we move on, uh, we had a job to do in building the SVR4 command set. We had an awful lot of commands, hundreds upon hundreds of commands to examine, uh, to determine, well, first of all, are they covered by an existing standard? Is this something we have to support because the industry has told us? Um, if so, then it had to be an SVR4. Um, if not, is it something that people have said, we really want this, this, this represents uh, a great deal of value to us and our customers. Um, is the given command overlapping an existing System 5 command? Is there some way we can uh, creatively incorporate tech, tech, that technology into our existing command, our existing interface, and this way deliver the functionality without um, an unnecessary duplication of, uh, the, of code and effort? Uh, one of the so then we have a, a few different outcomes that are possible here. We could have added a command uh, that we were considering uh, to SVR4 proper, and we'll see a list of those in a second. Uh, we could have uh, decided, we could have elected to incorporate that technology into an existing command. And finally, we could have elected to put something in a compatibility package. Let's take a look at some of the commands we've added to Unix System 5 Release 4. Uh, going down this list, you see some perennial favorites like more and page, uh, talk, uh, also things like the C shell. These are things that are going into SVR4. Um, and I think it's important to note that they're not, uh, they're not any different than the other Unix System 5 uh, Release 4 commands. They're not going to be denoted as Berkeley commands. These are now part of System 5. This is a partial list, by the way. Um, Again, it's important that we uh, creatively merge commands where appropriate uh, to reduce redundancy, and I think we've done that in a lot of key areas. Um, and we just have a, a, a list here of uh, some of the things I picked out. Uh, CP minus R for recursively copying. In System 5, you did it with a find piped into uh, CPIO. Uh, in Unix System 5 Release 4, you're going to be able to use the BSD CP, CP minus R. Going down the list, we've also done things like uh, change own, change mod, and change group minus capital R to recursively apply uh, those operations on uh, sets of files and directories. These are examples of places where we don't have a duplication of effort. We've just taken um, useful options and folded them in. Finally, we have some things uh, that did not go into Unix System 5 Release 4 proper. These will be on the source tape. They will be sectioned out in a compatibility package, and they will be available for vendors to put on their implementations. Uh, things like hostname or BIF. Uh, BIF is a good example. Uh, it's something that people have come to rely on in certain uh, BSD uh, systems. In, in SVR4, our mail system incorporates the technology that BIF provided. People are already using BIF, may want to continue to use BIF for a while, but then we're going to encourage people to start moving over to the standard, inter standard interfaces. To talk about commands, uh, you really have to talk about shells. Um, and Unix System 5 Release 4, uh, in order to meet the needs of the marketplace, is providing three shells in this release. Um, the first shell is a System 5 shell, uh, the, uh, the shell that I think most people use as the portable standard for command level interfaces across the industry. Uh, if you want to write a portable shell script, you write it in System 5 shell language. But people have told us, especially for interactive use, that they want a couple of different other shells. 
uh, one being the seashell from the University of California at Berkeley, and the other being the corn shell developed at AT&T Bell Labs. So by bringing all, it, all three into release, we, uh, we hope to accomplish, again, this easy migration path to SVR4. But again, one interface and one interface only is defined in the SVID, and that's the System 5 shell. So if you have an application that needs to write shell language programs, you need to incorporate